Quiz. Questions. Start off with that first. So when I looked at the scores, I'll unlock them on Canvas. Um, you, you got them in front of you there. Uh, there were kind of two camps, those who did quite well and those who did quite not so well. Um, so what I wanted to do was go through the problems, break them down a little bit, <clears throat> and see if we can use these example problems as a strategy for the exam. The exam will be a week from Friday. I'll be posting a practice exam this Friday that you'll have kind of a week to tinker with. Um, Jin Mei is out until the exam, so I'm the only help you got in terms of office hours and questions. So please feel free to stop in, email, anything uh, that I can do to help you out. I will try my best to do so. Okay. So, question one. We have the Clausius equation of state, which is basically a truncated version of the van der Waals, which includes only the excluded volume from the molecules themselves. So the question states, assume the fluid for this problem follows the Clausius equation of state. There we go. What is the change in entropy when one mole of the fluid is isothermally compressed from one cubic meter to 100 cubic centimeters or 100 milliliters? Use the value of blah for B. Okay. First, I'll stop our head. What type of question is this? How would we classify this problem? Is it phase equilibrium? Is it uh, energy balance? It's an energy balance type. Well, it's not a balance per se, right? Because I don't really care about how much heat or work this process takes. I care about one thing and one thing only. What is that? Entropy. Entropy is a what kind of function? So this is a state, function, property, change. It is not an ideal gas, so we cannot use the ideal gas relationships. So let's go to our equation sheet. Virtually everything that we'll be working on will start off on this sheet here. What is my starting point? Where should I be looking here? <laughs> I've got energy and entropy balances, I've got ideal gas relationships, I've got material properties, which are effectively just definitions, right? If you look at the state function change changes. Okay. We are talking about entropy changes, that narrows it down quite a lot. We're talking about entropy changes as a function of specific volume. So if you look at the values on, the, in the, in the, on our equation sheet over here, right, we have entropy, but it's always as a function of something weird. Right, as a function of H and P. No, that's not really helpful. Uh, here's S as a function of V and A. Right, but if we see over here, these are the equations, these four in the middle chunk. Those are the ones that we spent about a day and a half of class deriving. Right, these first chunk of equations in the equation sheet, these are the ones that are just definitions and manipulations of the first and second law of thermodynamics. The second chunk is when we converted those into functional forms that we have that are useful for changes in temperature and pressure. Right? And we did that using triple product rule, the chain rule, and a bunch of other little thermodynamic tricks. Okay, which one are we starting off with? DS is equal to what? What one are we going to use? CV. So we are going from state one, which is at T1 and some P1, which is one cubic meter, to state two, which is at T1 P2 equals to 100 centimeters cubed, or we can think of this as a milliliter. And again, unit conversion questions always ask me if you're not confident on that. So one, let's see how this goes, 1,000 milliliters equals one liter, 1,000 liters equals one uh, cubic meter. Okay, so this is basically divided by 1,000, divided by, so it's 10 to the 2 divided by 10 to the 6, which is equal to 10 to the minus 4. Did that correctly. <coughs> How's everyone feeling so far? Dying marker. So, all we need to do is evaluate this integral. Delta S 
the change in entropy going from state one to state two is simply the integration going from state one to state two of ds. We're integrating over a path of constant temperature, so this goes to zero. So what we need to do is integrate from our specific volume one to our specific volume two. Oh, sorry, I screwed this up. Of this function here. Getting to this point here got you a good chunk of the points, over half of the points. The last step would be, sorry, no, 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 half the points would be if we successfully integrate this. Is, this, is the, this is the start of the problem. So we have to calculate dp dt. This is just equal to r minus d. This was, this was a good chunk of the problem. Let's get the point get here. Now we integrate this. Right? <clears throat> and we get that this is R ln of V uh, 2 minus V. Sorry, this is not specific volume, it's actual volume. And plug the numbers in. And the number that I got was about minus 80. This is not an ideal gas. So the whole reason why we've done everything in this class up to this point is to not <coughs> use only ideal gas relationships. So that's why uh, the book was thrown at you if, if the problem was started off um, as an ideal gas problem, unfortunately. Okay, question two. What kind of question is Number two, there's, I guess there's a couple different concepts. Okay, so this question, we're going to use the HS diagram, which I didn't have attached here. Oops. Oh, no, I do have it here. Okay. A, what is the saturation temperature of water at a pressure of 1,500 kilopascals? What kind of question is this? Is it a balance, a state change? What kind of, what kind of question is this? Diagram. diagram. Well, the diagram helps us solve the problem, but the diagram is not the problem. Oh, it's a balance. For A, I would say it is not a balance. I would say A is a phase equilibrium problem. Right? Noting that at a, when we have a saturated system, that means that we can fix either the temperature or we can fix either the pressure. So we've given one piece of information here, which is the saturation pressure is 1,500 kilopascals, which means we need to find out at what temperature does this fluid, which is water or steam, at what temperature does the steam meet at 1,500 kilopascals and the saturation line? Right, so all engineering charts rely on fixing only two pieces of information. The two pieces of information that we fix on this problem are pressure and the notion that we're on the saturation line. So I will try my best to very shoddily reproduce this figure. We have enthalpy, we have entropy. The temperature lines are dashed and they start off straight, but then they go down. So this is T in degrees Celsius. The saturation line looks something like this. It's bolded. <clears throat> and the pressure lines uh, kind of go like this. Is that an artist rendition? So, we have to make sure that one of these lines is 1,500 kilopascals. This is the saturation. A lot of people just drew straight over here. But instead, we have to follow the line up here. And it was the about, isotherm, right? Yes, follow the isotherm. 
Because if we go on a line that's horizontal, that's not a constant temperature. That is a constant enthalpy. So what we need to do is find the temperature line and follow it to where it meets all of these points in one, one joint location. But that was probably one of the most common errors I saw is people just drew a line horizontally across and they got about 150. Okay, question two, or B. Water at a flow rate of one kilogram per second is being pressurized from 2,000 to 20,000 kilopascals. The initial temperature is 240. What is the power to require, required if this process is to be performed ice and tropically? So, what kind of question is this? This is an energy balance. This is an energy balance. Ice and tropically tells us what piece of information on this chart? Entropy is constant, which means that our entire process has to fall on one vertical line. So, let's start off. It's an energy balance. Let's start off with our energy balance. Right? The, chart, the chart is nothing other than a big data table. The data table doesn't help you solve the problem until you know what you're looking for in the problem. So our energy balance, we're going to assume it's steady state always. Again, these types of questions Always ask if you're not sure, right? You say, hey, Professor, Fischer, is, this, is this a steady state process? Yeah, assume steady state. You know, if it's part of the question, I'll say I can't help you. But in general, right, unless we want to have a problem statement that's, you know, two paragraphs long with all the assumptions, we have to kind of work with some implicit assumptions here. So if you're ever uncertain about is it steady state, is it not, let me know. I'll always try and help you answer the questions. Okay, we have the summation. In this case, I'll write it as the mass flow rate times by the mass specific enthalpy for each stream in. Right, and so I saw both approaches either saying the work is zero or the Q is zero. Either one basically is fine. Energy is energy. Um, I personally thought of this as the heat was zero and that we're talking about work, but ultimately it doesn't matter. Now, when we have one stream in and one stream out, This is how it simplifies. We have the mass flow rate, which is one kilogram per second. Sorry, we're adding what comes into the system. We're subtracting what comes out. And then the balance has to be made up by the power input or output of the system. Now, when we move the enthalpy to the other side, right, we're ultimately solving for the power. That's what we want. That's where we get the out minus in notation, which we call delta H. Right, so we can call this part here delta H hat, change in enthalpy with respect to the mass of the fluid. Now, this is our energy balance. Next step is all we need the chart for is to help us look up what the enthalpies are at the inlet and the outlet conditions. So the inlet condition, we are said it is at pressure 1 is 2,000, temperature 1 is 240 degrees Celsius. So I have two pieces of information. This is a single component fluid. That means I have fully defined my system. I could be able to look at my entropy, my enthalpy, my specific volume, everything in the world. I have two pieces of information for a single fluid. That is a fully defined system. For a saturated fluid, I need one piece of information. So what I need to do is find the 2,000 line, and I'm just going to say this is 2,000 now. And what I try to do in these problems on the charts is I try and make it so that the starting and end points are actually at relatively easy to read positions. So if you look at it, the intersection between 2,000 kilopascals and 240 it should lie at the nexus kind of, of temperature, pressure, and enthalpy on, a, on one of the grid lines. Because right? I don't want the, the reading the chart to be the challenging part of the problem. So if you can get your magnifying glasses out and squint, uh, this corresponded here. Again, I'm just going to dynamically change everything. 240. And then the number that I got was, I think, let's see, 
uh, 8O was my H1. Does that look about right? Everyone following along pretty closely? Okay, then the next part says pressure 2 is at 20,000 kilopascals, but we're getting there isentropically. So now let's just say I'll draw another line up here. This is my 20,000 line. Okay, so I have to get from my starting point here to somewhere on the 20,000 line with a constant entropy, which basically means that I just have to follow a straight line up until it intersects. And again, I tried to <clears throat> make it so it lined up as best I could. And that corresponded to a specific enthalpy of 3540, I believe. 3540. And I was pretty lenient on, on reading the chart unless there was total chaos in trying to draw a straight line. But in terms of did you get 3540 or 3520 or 3580, I was pretty generous with small changes like that, especially if it was clear that you were drawing the right path on, on the diagram. Okay, so that's just plug and chug here, and the power was, I don't remember what the exact number was, let me see, uh, 660 kilojoules per second. Questions? How are we doing so far? Good? Now the dreaded entropy question. Okay, part C. What is the rate of entropy generation if the final temperature of the system described in B is 700, but the final pressure is still 20,000 kilopascals? Okay. So, what kind of question is this? Entropy balance, entropy balance question. Same approach here. The rate of entropy generation uh, is equal to the mass flow rate times by the difference in the entropies. So what we need to do is we have our starting point, which was the same as last time. So we can get our entropy 1. I believe it was 6.5 was the number. Now entropy 2 is we have to find out where the 20,000 kilopascal line crosses the 700 degree temperature line. And it was you know, actually well, it's over here like this. This is 700 degrees Celsius. This is our 20,000 kilopascals line. We generated some entropy in the process, 6.8. And so then the answer here was 0 0.3 uh, kilojoules per Kelvin. What was the units on this? Yeah, kilojoules per Kelvin second. Questions. How does everyone feel about this? So on the exam, these are the types of questions that I will be asking. <coughs> when the uh, It's always, I, I, I never tend to ask questions that I feel, and again, you can probably disagree with me on this, that require an inordinate amount of busy work. <clears throat> I tend to focus on questions that test key concepts. So in order to fill out an exam's worth of material, that means I try to write a, what I consider, a relatively straightforward question that tests concepts. But that means that I'm going to test on basically every concept that's possible. Because if I think about writing the exam as concept-based, then any two questions that test the same concept are kind of a waste of everyone's time. 
And if you get one, then I would assume you would get the other one as well. So my exams are always difficult, not in terms of the depth, but in terms of the breadth of information. Right? So every little key concept on the homework that's been asked about, that is 100% fair game. Right? Even if it may only seem tangentially related. If you feel comfortable on the homework, then I'm confident that you should feel comfortable on the exams. Just because you're getting a good score on the homework doesn't necessarily mean that you have a full comprehension. I can't judge that. Only you guys can judge that individually. So the quiz is a mile, mile post. And on some areas, I was a little bit generous. But particularly the units here, I was a bit generous. Um, the energy balances, um, I was a little generous on these. Uh, if it seemed like you had a good comprehension of where you were going with the energy balance, then I erred in the side of, in your favor. But if it was just the energy balance written out with no sort of uh, manipulation based on the system conditions, then, then, then I did not give you the credit for that one. And that's sort of the decision making process. No questions at all. So Chin Mei uh, was very gracious enough to fill in for me while I was um, out at a research meeting at Idaho National Labs. Uh, so what that means is that we've transitioned over to a new topic and that uh, I'm going to have to pick up where he left off. And we have transition into multi-component systems. There will be a little bit of multi-component systems on the exam, but uh, the main emphasis of the exam is going to be on state changes, single component systems, energy balances, entropy balances, and uh, single component phase transitions. With a obviously heavy emphasis on non-ideal fluids. Ideal gas type problems, because it's so easy to calculate state change with ideal gases, anytime you see an extensive balance, you could probably expect that it's going to be an ideal gas involved in the balance. Anytime you're going to see potentially an extensive state change calculation, it's probably going to be a real fluid, right? Because at this point, I'm expecting that everyone should be able to just grab off the shelf any one of those um, uh, ideal gas relationships and be totally fine and comfortable with that. Okay, multi-component system. So basically what we're doing is everything that we've done to this point all over again, but with a very confusing notation system. So, <clears throat> as a recap, we use this general term theta to signify any state property, volume, enthalpy, entropy, all sorts of different types of things. So when we have the line underneath it, that corresponds to the total fluid molar property. Underbar with a subscript. This is going to mean that it's for the pure species of type I. Overbar plus the subscript I, this is our clue that we are dealing with a partial molar property. This is a definition. So this term right here is going to be our gateway into multi-component, multi-phase 
equilibrium calculations. Nothing about the first and second laws of thermodynamics have changed when we transition from a single component system to a multi-component system. However, if we consider this to be the partial molar Gibbs free energy, also known as the chemical potential, which we'll talk about. Chimay did not talk about the chemical potential, right? He did or did not? He did not. Okay. So we're going to be defining this term with the Gibbs free energy as the chemical potential. What this means is that we're saying that the partial molar property is effectively how much does the total system property change as a result of adding a little bit of component I into the system while holding the temperature, pressure, and the rest of the moles constant. Now this term is very annoying to write. So I will oftentimes leave it out when we're talking about a multi-component system dealing with these derivatives. Again, these are just convenience notations to remind us what type of system we're working in. When we're talking about phase equilibrium, everything about the Gibbs free energy related to the chemical potential is because we prefer to work in pressure temperature systems. Meaning that if I'm going to go through the hassle of mixing two real fluids together, right? Mixing two ideal gases together is pretty simple. Right? There's only a little bit of complexity um, in the entropy of mixing. But mixing two ideal gases together is what people in thermodynamics consider to be you know, a very basic calculation. So we don't typically care about that. What we care about is the deviation from ideal mixing. So when we're going through our calculations that are very tedious, we would prefer to lump all of the non-ideal characteristics of a particular fluid into its own individual properties. So if I have water and I have ethanol, right, and I have an equation of state that accurately describes both of them, I'm going to calculate the properties of water at some temperature and pressure, the properties of ethanol at some temperature and pressure, and say, good, I'm done with that portion of the calculation. Next, I'm going to add the introduce the complexity of mixing the two fluids together. So I'm almost always going to be doing my mixing calculations at constant temperature and pressure. If we vary that, that means our definition of the partial molar property is going to change which means that we would effectively have to reformulate a large fraction of the derivations that we're working with now. So again, thermo is the system that we've used to help us organize our thoughts and our calculations. And it seems to work pretty well, so I'm going to trust it. But in some other types of fields, we may not want to work at constant temperature and pressure. Maybe we want to work at constant temperature and volume. Or maybe we want to work at constant entropy and V, or maybe constant U and V, in which case we would have to slightly reformulate what we're talking about here. But in chemical engineering, for continuum scale systems, anything that has to do with a practical implementation of what we're really doing, this is the system we want to subscribe to. But remember, this is a definition based on how we like to work with systems. We can rederive absolutely everything, but in a different set of conditions. Just keep that in mind. So the cool thing with the partial molar property, and this is something I believe Chin May should have at least uh, uh, covered a little bit. The math is not particularly pleasant, but the conclusion is nice. The reason why uh, we like to use this partial molar property formulation is that if we take a weighted average of the partial molar properties, weighted based on their mole fraction, that's what the x is, that gives us the total system property. Right, so if we add all those up. Uh, we also have the change in mixing. This is how much the, so this could be enthalpy change of mixing, this could be volume change of mixing. Doing some a little bit of manipulation. This is how the total system property would be as a deviation from just a straightforward averaging of the pure species properties. Right, so this is just a, if I had a plot of 
the system properties as a function of the mole fraction of species one. This would be the pure species two property. This would be the pure species one property. If nothing was changing as a result of mixing, a good example of this is volume additivity. If I have one liter of A and one liter of B and I mix them to get two liters, that means I have zero volume change of mixing. That means I would fall somewhere on a dashed line here. The real property might be totally different. Right? Any of these lines are totally possible. So I could have negative change in mixing, and I have positive change in mixing. It can transition from negative to positive change of mixing based on how much of the fluid I add to the system. All bets are off when we go to multi-component systems. What we're talking about here for the next day or so is all going to be about um, anything that doesn't have entropy involved. Because entropy makes things a little bit trickier. So this is specifically for enthalpy, volume, and, and uh, internal energy. Anything with entropy, so Helmholtz, Gibbs, <coughs> obviously entropy, uh, you do have uh, um, entropy generation as a result of mixing all these. Okay, and so we can also rearrange this by substituting in this expression into here, and we can show that the uh, change in mixing properties is related to the difference between the partial molar property, how the fluid behaves in the mixture, minus the pure species property. So for an ideal system, we have no enthalpy change of mixing, we have no volume change of mixing. So we define an ideal system as where the partial molar property is equal to the pure species property. Now, as a big caveat, most of this, some, so the, the definitions apply, but uh, this, this aspect right here, rather, this is for, oops, not entropy, uh, and uh, you, have, you have ideal gas, um, ideal gases when you mix them always have entropy changes associated with them. Okay. <clears throat> So, I'm just trying to make sure I catch up here <coughs> with everything that's going on. Okay, so what we're going to talk about is the chemical potential. And the gibbs Duham equation, because there's a lot of cool discussion. jump around a little bit on this one. <clears throat> okay. So if we take the Gibbs free energy and we expand it with respect to changes in temperature, pressure, and the composition of the system, so all of the different molar properties. Again, this is usually our starting point for many derivations. That constant P and N. We can relate this to 
using thermodynamic identities, a simpler expression. So these are exactly equivalent expressions here. And I believe that uh, Chin Mei discussed the equilibrium criteria. That chemical potential, this at equilibrium, at equilibrium. That is our equilibrium criteria for a multi-component, multi-phase system. So when we expand the Gibbs free energy, if we mix things at constant temperature and we mix things at constant pressure, then the only thing that we have to worry about is making sure that the partial molar Gibbs free energy of the system is flat across the phase transition boundary meaning that the chemical potential of phase one has to be equal to the chemical potential of phase two for each of the individual species, right? So that's where this comes from. So this is for a uh, system at constant temperature and pressure where we expanded the Gibbs free energy. So we can do the same process. We can expand enthalpy with respect to pressure, entropy, and again, the composition. Maybe it's not useful from a practical sense, but maybe you can envision a theoretical system where you're isentropically and isobarically mixing something. Off the top of my head, I'll be honest, I can't think of a good system right now. But it illustrates a point. Um, change in enthalpy, we do exactly the same procedure. But in this case, it's going to be constant S and I, D, P, S, H, D, S, and constant Again, we've got this obnoxious little we're holding all of the species J constant as long as they're not species I. Meaning if I've got a bin of one mole of each of five components, if I add a little bit of component one, I'm still keeping all the other components constant. So that's basically what we're saying. So if I add a little bit of species I, how is the overall enthalpy changing? So you're just adding like pure I to the system? Yes, that would be the case, yeah. And again, these are all, of course, the, so this is the partial molar Gibbs, right, based on the definition here. The number of moles times by the partial, sorry, by the molar property, right, is the same thing as just the molar property changing here. So, <clears throat> through identities, we can show that dH dP is equal to the volume, and that dH dS is the temperature. And that's the partial molar enthalpy. One thing to note, the change in enthalpy with respect to species I at constant temperature pressure is not equal to the change in enthalpy with respect to adding species I at constant S and P. Sorry, this is not the partial molar. That's I just totally off base here. 
just contradiction myself. So whereas this is the partial molar enthalpy, this is what we're talking about. Right? This is the derivative. How the enthalpy changes with respect to adding or subtracting species I, but we're doing so isentropically and isobarically. Recall that we've defined the partial molar property as the change in enthalpy with respect to changes in N at temperature and pressure. Okay, so now we have this relationship here where we know that this term is very important for phase equilibrium calculations. So what we're going to do is we're going to relate this expansion with the Gibbs free energy to this expansion of the enthalpy. Right, so if we write that the Gibbs free energy is defined as the enthalpy minus Ts, the change in Gibbs and we can just expand it with respect using the product rule. Solve for enthalpy here. Substitute in our expression for the Gibbs free energy here. So take our Gibbs and substitute it in here. This is right. This is plus, and this is plus. That's why. Okay. Because you have to move these to the other side of the equation. Very valid in algebra today. Okay. Let's get in here. Uh, plus V D P plus summation of Gibbs. The terms cancel out. A couple of terms look very familiar. So we can see here this is expansion of enthalpy with respect to pressure and entropy and the number of moles. We derived this expression. Here we just took the definition of the Gibbs free energy and the expansion of the Gibbs free energy with respect to temperature, pressure, and number of moles. And again, we all know the end conclusion and result of this, and that's why we chose to expand Gibbs with respect to temperature and pressure, because those are its native variables. We chose to expand enthalpy with respect to its native variables, pressure and entropy. So we kind of were, were clever in selection of our approach here. And so we can see that first term is exactly identical to the first term. Second term is exactly identical to the second term. That means that the third term has to be exactly identical to the third term. So that gets us to our definition of the chemical potential. Where we have we denote it with this subscript mu sub i. It can be defined in many, many different ways. For temperature pressure systems, it is the partial uh, Gibbs. Temperature 
temperature, pressure, Nj not equal to I. For the uh, system that we just looked at, it is the change in enthalpy with respect to changing the number of moles. If we were to mix it at constant pressure and entropy, and again, Nj not equal to I, it is also equal to the change in internal energy with respect to the change in number of moles, and we can show this from similar analysis in a constant UV uh, system, no, SV system. SV system, and J not equal to I. It is also equal to the change in the Helmholtz energy with respect to I at a constant temperature volume system, and again, N J. So what we'll be doing over the next little bit is focusing on how do we calculate the partial molar Gibbs free energy. Because this is the term that is related to phase equilibrium for multi-component, multi-phase systems. The fugacity will be defined as the deviation, the partial molar fugacity will be defined as the deviation between a real fluid's partial molar Gibbs and an ideal gas partial molar Gibbs. So exactly in the same way. And we'll see that the fugacity itself is again a useful term to help us calculate phase equilibrium calculations. When we start talking about ideal gas systems, then it will become apparent why we have to worry about um, the difference between fugacity and partial molar gives. Because we have some discontinuities or some infinite terms that appear when we try and calculate the partial gives for a real system. So the, the takeaway from this though, this is what we're most likely going to be working with in this class here. We care about changes in temperature and pressure. Sorry, we want to mix things at constant temperature and pressure. So we tend to gravitate towards the Gibbs free energy as the chemical potential. Different fields and different disciplines may use different types of systems. So in the case of fundamental uh, kind of physical chemistry type calculations, this is maybe the most important one we want to look at, right? Because maybe it's easier to think about the system or the universe of having a constant, uh, a constant volume or constant entropy. In the case of liquid systems, strictly liquid systems that you want to assume as uh, incompressible, Helmholtz energy is where we want to look at. And so in this case here, we're going to hold the temperature and volume constant. Or maybe let's say we're doing a computer simulation. In a computer simulation, right, we have a potentially a 3D box Oftentimes they have different types of shapes because they're a little bit more computationally efficient. And we have particles in here, and they're zipping around. When we're doing a computer simulation like this, oftentimes it's convenient to simulate holding constant number of moles, constant volume, and constant temperature constant, or NVU is another common one as well where you keep the number of moles in the simulation constant, the volume of the simulation box constant, and the energy of the simulation box constant. If we make it one step more difficult, we keep the number of moles constant, the volume of the box constant, and the temperature constant, we have to introduce something called a thermostat. Because the temperature is the average kinetic energy of the particles in the system, meaning that due to numerical uncertainty, that temperature starts to drift around. And so we have to artificially manipulate it. If you want to go to an NPT system, where the number of moles are held constant, the pressure is held constant, and the temperature is held constant, then not only do you have to vary the velocities of the particles, you also have to vary the box size. So the simulations get a little bit more tedious, and you introduce a additional sources from, for uncertainty in your fundamental calculations. So if you were to do a simple simulation, NVT is way more straightforward to do than an NPT simulation. In which case, if you're trying to calculate any phase equilibrium properties, you would always want to work in Helmholtz energy. Or if you're working in an NVU system, then you'd maybe want to work with a different definition of your chemical potential for phase equilibrium calculations. So for what we're talking about on the macro scale, this is by far the most useful representation of the, Gibbs, of, the part, of the chemical potential. But depending on where everyone's research goes, you may encounter simulation papers 
that talk about the chemical potential in different terms. So oftentimes, if you look at strictly a chemical engineering textbook, you'll always see it written like this with the partial molar Gibbs. If you read any physical chemistry literature, you'll almost never see partial molar Gibbs. You will only see the chemical potential because the understanding there is noting that we don't really care what we're using to represent the chemical potential because it all depends on how you're defining and describing your system. So we didn't have a chance to talk about the gibbs dunham equation, but uh, we'll hit that on Friday. Okay, homework. Uh, Chin may mention that uh, he would prefer it if he could submit it electronically. He didn't, didn't say that there was any significant objections to that. So let me know if you have any difficulties getting that scanned in. Uh, but I bumped it back because I heard you guys had a, a rough couple of days with respect to homework, so hopefully that gives you a little bit more time to, to sit down and focus on it. Uh, I'll post homework three either today or tomorrow, and uh, I'll post a practice exam on Friday for the real deal next week. So one week from today will be a review day, so start thinking about questions about that. Cool. Uh, so if Chinmay's grading electronically, I don't need to see it. Yeah, just make sure you submit it by that 10 a.m. deadline. Um, otherwise, we'll, we'll be more strict as time goes on for the lateness. Yeah. Um, can we get a numerical answer for four questions for the substitution? For which one, sorry? The departure function. Oh, uh, yes. So if you email me, so I believe, uh, email me and I'll, I'll shoot you the answers, yeah. But in general, I, I never, I never um, don't give you the answers if you ask, or at least give you a close estimate.